end of Europe as we know it. And there was a collective sigh of, a sigh of relief after the second round, but perhaps less enthusiasm about uh, Macron's uh, victory. Uh, I have five very accomplished colleagues from three leading Hong Kong universities to discuss the result, and I'll introduce them in the order of their appearance. So I welcome Professor Alistair Cole, who is head of uh, Department of Government and International Studies at Hong Kong Baptist University. I welcome uh, my colleague, uh, Sylvian Holterman, who is director of our French program at Hong Kong U. Uh, I welcome Professor Pierre Landry, who is professor of government and public administration at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And uh, Emily Chan is program director of European studies and French stream coordinator at Hong Kong Baptist University. And, and last but not least, my boss, <laughs> and a very accomplished uh, 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 scholar of European studies, head of modern languages and cultures, Dr. Roland uh, Fox. So I would like to start with Alistair and, and, and a question, a somewhat provocative question, what's wrong with Macron? He won, of course, but we also know that uh, many, many French people uh, did not uh, so much as vote for Macron, but they basically voted against uh, Marine Le Pen. Macron actually acknowledged it uh, himself. He's aware of, of a significant proportion of the electorate basically opting for what they considered a, a lesser evil in, in some ways, right? So, so there are problems for domestic uh, politics, I suppose. The question that I want to put to all of you is what to expect from the uh, second presidency of, of Macron and, and Alistair, starting with you, perhaps, focusing on the domestic agendas that, that played an important role, of course, in the electoral campaign. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Stefan, and, and welcome to everybody. It's great to be part of this, uh, this wonderful gathering. Um, I, uh, this rather provocative question, what's wrong with Macron? Obviously, you can, uh, you can invite uh, all sorts of uh, uh, interesting angles. I'd like to start to sort of preface it with a what's right with Macron type of uh, response in a sense, because I think we shouldn't under, underplay the, the extent of the performance. I mean, he was, he's re-elected as the first president um, to be re-elected outside of a, the very specific circumstances of cohabitation, which is in itself a big achievement. I mean, I think we could say, I think we have to, uh, we have to challenge uh, the, 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 the narrative going around at the moment that he's been poorly or elected or even illegitimately elected. And that's partly a political narrative, of course, being, vehicled in particular by uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon and, uh, uh, and the people in La France uh, and Soumise. But just look at the figures. I mean, he got more votes than François Hollande 10 years ago. He got more registered electors than Georges Pompidou back in 1969. So in actual fact, if, we, if we're trying to, you know, I think we need to dispel this notion of uh, illegitimacy. However, it is certainly true that it's, a, it's not as strange a question as all of that. The, the election revealed very disturbing trends in French democracy, consolidation of the far right, rise of abstentions, the collapse in the sense of the traditional center left and center right pivots, the strong performance of anti-system parties and so on. All of those, uh, I'm sure others will comment uh, upon that. So what to expect then? Um, that's a big question and I suppose we have expectations sometimes based on our readings of the past and sometimes based on our appreciation of the challenges of the future. And indeed, sometimes on purely pragmatic responses of the present. And I think actually with Macron, we need to take those three dimensions into, in, into account really. If we look back to Macron's past, we could say, let's not underestimate that this was actually a highly reformist uh, president in the first year of his mandate. Uh, certainly crisis set in, uh, social crisis, health crisis, international crisis, um, economic crisis. But I don't think we should underplay the extent to which the, the early Macron, in a sense, of the first year of his last uh, time in office was a reforming president. Um, what about the present then? That, well, clearly there is a sense in that you know, Macron's clearly would have appeared during the campaign, at least, to be guided above all by, uh, I suppose, a form of enlightened pragmatism, um, including a particular understanding of triangulation, which meaning meaning that he's going uh, desperately to search the ideas of his main political opponents, uh, 
not just Jean-Luc Mélenchon, but even the slogans of uh, Philippe Poutou of the uh, new anti-capitalist party. Uh, and I think in a sense that there is, of course, a bit of that. What does a, a successful center, centrist politic, politician do? I mean, in a sense, I suppose, aggregating uh, some rather distinct interests would appear to be part of the... Uh, part of the positioning, really, I think, uh, of Macron as a president. So I think they're looking to the future because that's what we're really interested in. And there's loads of challenges. And again, to sort of temporarily space them out, perhaps. The first challenge is, of course, to get a majority in the uh, up and coming uh, uh, elections for the uh, legislative elections. There is, of course, a powerful mechanism for an, a, a recently elected president to get that majority. Uh, won't go into it too much here, but the idea that's being peddled by Monsieur Mélenchon at the moment that he'll be the France's next prime minister is to be taken with a little bit of a pinch of salt, I think. I think if the left parties were to be able to get together, they'd need, of course, to get an average of 25% because of the, the necessity to get 12.5% of registered electors to go through to the second round. I think it's unlikely. I think there will be a presidential majority uh, in the tradition, actually, of the Fifth Republic, particularly in the post Cancana tradition. So that might well leave uh, uh, Macron with a majority, but the real question is, uh, so what? You know, it's that difficult, so what question. What will Macron do with this majority? If we think about the, 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 the very few comments, uh, promises that Macron made during the election, one was about to change the pension age to 65, um, which predictably didn't go down particularly well. Another one was to create a more rigorous regime for uh, the, the basic welfare benefits and particularly the minimum, minimum uh, income. Um, those are probably, depending on one's point of view, important issues. They're important issues that should be properly debated in a democratic way. I think there is an unfortunate tendency, perhaps in the Fifth Republic, for governments without a majority to rely on the restrictive clauses of the 1958 constitution and particularly Article 49, Clause 3, which, of course, allows a government to stake its uh, future on passing uh, a controversial act like pension reform. And, of course, um, Bruno Le Maire, the, uh, the current uh, economy minister, let slip that he thought, of course, they could use 49.3 to push through pension reform. I think that will have a big problem in the second issue, which is the level of trust in politicians in France, which is, we, we don't need to go over this very, very low. Uh, I don't, not blaming Macron for this, except that Macron does represent a form of post-politics in a way that frames political forces like parties as in a sense, of in a negative sense. And it makes it a little bit more difficult to uh, imagine where are the forces, either party, political parties or, or associations or core intermediaire that can sustain this sort of uh, reform. So that might be a second challenge. I think a third challenge, and I'm sure I'm up to my, my eight minutes are up, I think is the economic one. I mean, it's clear that there's been a, 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 a you know, a, a, a generous, we might say, reaction to uh, the social health and now international crises that have had an impact on the public finances. Um, and I think that the, uh, the economic problems that lie ahead are going to be uh, serious ones, and they will actually impose some difficult uh, choices. And I suppose the real challenge is, you know, not so much to talk about the third round, the third social round and the strikes, but whether the new presidency will have that capacity to be able to manage the necessary reforms that need to be, uh, uh, that need to take place and to, and to steer the economy. Thank you, Alistair. Thank you, and thank you for keeping to the time frame. And I should have said that uh, from the beginning, the format we all agreed to is that everyone speaks to up to eight minutes so that we have plenty of time for discussion. So this is an invitation to the audience to think of questions to our uh, panelists. Uh, we will have plenty of time to, to, to uh, dig uh, deeper into, into the issues raised. So Alistair pushed back against my suggestion that, that uh, Macron uh, isn't as popular as the result uh, suggests, so I, I can I can take it back. But it's undeniable, though, that a significant proportion of the French electorate doesn't feel uh, represented by uh, Macron, and and there is a kind of growing divide, and that is not true just the, of of France across Western societies. Right, there is a growing divide between urban, uh, globalized populations, if you want, uh, and 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 the rural. Uh, uh, population. I mean, David Goodhart uh, uh, wrote about 
uh, the people, the, the anywheres and, and, and the somewheres, right? Uh, and and I, I think that, that the, the vote also uh, reflected that. So what I want to ask uh, Sylvian, uh, Sylvain is, is uh, what explains the enduring attraction of, of radical alternatives such as uh, Marine uh, Le Pen, uh, uh, particularly then in, in, in rural areas of France? And well, again, yeah. the question also, what, what do you expect of the second presidency by Macron? Is it business as usual, more of the same, or, or is he going to reinvent himself also domestically? Sure, thank you, Stefan, and wonderful to be here. Well, I'm certainly not going to uh, push back against uh, what you said, because this presidential election confirmed really a profound change in uh, France's political landscape uh, with a uh, uh, deep polarization of what some analysts sees as a three polarization and the fact that the radical options on the two end of the political spectrums now uh, represents the majority of voters. Uh, so of course there is the historical high score of the far right candidates, Marine Le Pen, and the fact that for the third time since 2002, the third time, sorry, her party, the Rassemblement National, which was uh, called the Front National, uh, under our father's leadership, uh, accesses the second round of the presidential election. So uh, second round, uh, there was 2002, 2017, and, and 2022. And on the other side of the uh, political spectrum, as uh, Alistair was uh, pointed out, uh, we must note the very good score of the radical left candidate, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who scored 22.2% of the voters. And he didn't get to the second round, but he came very close and very close to the score of uh, Marine Le Pen, who got 23% of the votes in the first round. And by comparison, uh, Macron got 27.5 uh, or 27.6%. So all in all, the radical options accounted to nearly 60% of the vote casted in the first round. Uh, and the, the more traditional moderate option represented only uh, less than 40% of the vote. And that includes the votes for uh, Macron, of course. And uh, this is something of great importance for the uh, upcoming legislative election in June and for uh, the, the next quinquennat of uh, Emmanuel Macron. Uh, and this is also why Mélenchon used uh, the term third round to refer to this uh, legislative election. Now, I'm using the term traditional to refer to more, more moderate options like the uh, moderate left, which was traditionally represented by the Parti Socialiste and the moderate right by Les Républicains. Because if you step back and you, these were the, really the heavyweights that dominated the French presidential election since the adoption of the Fifth Republic. So it's typically since 1965, we had the classic moderate left, moderate right opposition until 2002 when the far right eliminated the socialist candidate and got to the second round of the election, something that occurred again in 2017 and this year yet again. And what this election confirmed really here is the collapse of the major traditional political formation the Parti Socialiste and Les Républicains, who saw their lowest score on record for a presidential election. This is less than 5% for Valérie Pécresse and Les Républicains, which is a very low score, and less than 2% for Anne Hidalgo. So they won't even be able to uh, get the substantial reform for their uh, campaign, for their presidential campaign. At the same time, when you look at the score of Marine Le Pen, this election confirms the strong progression of the far right. And it signals as well the er erosion of the so-called Front Républicain, which in 2002 and 2017, so massive turnouts of voters, especially in 2002, that voted against the far right candidate that many people consider as a threat to the uh, Republican regime. So the progression of the far right is, is very substantial. In 2002, the uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen got 18% of the votes in 2017. Uh, Marine Le Pen got 34% and this year 41.5%. So we clearly see a progression here. And one more thing that we need to take into account about this election is the historically high abstention rate of 28%. And this um, shows a clear rejection of both 
Macron and Le Pen by a substantial proportion of voters, even at a time when one of the candidates can be seen as a threat to the Republican regime and, or even to democracy at large. So overall, the progression of radical alternatives doesn't really come as a complete surprise and, and it's certainly not an epiphenomenon. It's something that has been in the making ever since the late 90s or early 2000s. It's also something that can be seen in other Western democracies. Which brings us back to your question uh, as to why this enduring trend for radical al alternative. Well, as uh, you said before, many people in, in France feel misrepresented or not even represented at all by the traditional moderate political formation. Uh, which they see as favoring the rich and wealthy and neglecting the lower class or even the middle class. And adding to this, there is a old set of uh, wide ranging social economic issues, as well as uh, the issues of national security and social societal issues that can explain the, the progression of the uh, radical alternative. So Alistair was uh, talking about the uh, unemployment rates, especially in certain regions, which can be in part attributed to uh, the deindustrialization de combined with the rising cost of living, the depreciation of purchasing power, and to which we can add the question of pensions, of course, this complex question, the context of uh, in the context of French aging population. Uh, all these issues gave rise to major social movements, such as the yellow vest that we saw during uh, Macron first mandate. There's also the issue of national security that peaked after the wave of terrorist attack in 2015, and the issue of immigration, of course, which national, uh, which with national securities are topics that have long been exploited by the far right and that feed into uh, also uh, many discourse and the discourse of Islamophobia, for instance. And on top of that, well, you have other societal issues uh, that are also important, such as gay marriage that have divided French society in recent years. So many people who used to vote for the socialists felt disappointed or even betrayed when François Hollande in 2012, 2012 sorry, did not deliver on the promise that he made during his election campaign and instead engaged in a series of centrist-like reforms. Um, the same applies to Macron, was very quickly labeled as, uh, labeled as the president of the rich after his election in 2017. Uh, hence, maybe the success of uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon today. And on the other side of the political spectrum, the far-right formation of Le Front National of Jean-Marie Le Pen gained ground on the collapse of the uh, French Communist Party in the, in the 90s in the 1990s, and then the Rassemblement National of his daughter, Marine Le Pen, capitalized on uh, these wide ran ranging issues that we see today in the same opportunist way any other populist movement would do. Uh, what is also noticeable here is that while uh, Marine Le Pen position hasn't changed, she uses a much more Polish discourse now, uh, one that could appeal to voters of a more uh, moderate uh, right, uh, and this is, of course, reinforced by the new far-right candidate, Eric Zemmour, who uh, adopted a, a much more radical rhetoric. So in this context, what does Macron victory means for the urban rural or rural divide is hard to, to say, but uh, what we can see right now is that Macron is very conscious of the many difficulties ahead of him and is trying hard to regain the French people's trust. Uh, the nomination of the prime minister is a, uh, is a very key issue for that. Uh, and is hoping to form a government of presidential majority. Um, my guess is that is, this is not going to happen and probably in the next legislative election in June, what we will see is a new chapter of cohabitation. Thank you, thank you. So I, I want to continue in, in this analysis uh, and the question, Pierre, that I have uh, to you is to focus even more on the party uh, landscape, right? So basically Macron's party, the way I understand it, is simply the vehicle for Macron uh, to be elected and, and he has been successful. So the optimists say the center holds, right? That's the good news. Uh, Marine Le Pen was uh, uh, defeated. Uh, but on the downside, as, as, uh, uh, as Sylvain just, just discussed, the, the, the mainstream parties on the traditional left and the traditional right 
they've been decimated, right? I'm reminded of a path-breaking study by the Irish political scientist, the late Peter Mayer, Mayer who, who wrote about the ruling, uh, the void, right? He, he was concerned with the tendency across the Western world for the mainstream parties to be uh, delegitimized, to be losing uh, uh, popular support, even membership numbers, etc. So what are, we looking, what are we looking at in, in France? What do you expect from the second presidency of President Macron? And what do you expect medium long term in terms of the reconfiguration of the French uh, political landscape? Can the traditional parties be revived? Uh, uh, after, what, what would come after Macron, right? If you can even, even uh, push it back further. And, and another question that we haven't discussed yet, and I'm hoping that uh, all three remaining uh, uh, analysts might, might say something about it is the European dimension, right? Because what happens in France is greatly important to, to the rest of, of Europe. I mean, Macron is seen as the uh, potential leader. Uh, uh, you know, Marine Le Pen promised to make France great again. Macron time and again promises to make Europe uh, great again. So <laughs> what are we to expect in, in that respect? Yeah. Well, th thank you for the question. I think I will leave uh, the question of Europe to my uh, expert colleague, Emily, who knows a lot more about it than I do. Um, but I'd like, like Alistair, to would like to push back against the premise of your question. Uh, I am a lot more calm about what's happened uh, uh, at the elections than, than perhaps the other speakers, um, in the sense that Fundamentally, the Fifth Republic was created to destroy political parties. De Gaulle made it his personal program uh, to create a system in which the parties that dominated the Fourth Republic uh, would have a very hard time uh, uh, thriving as sort of institutionalized bodies. And we've seen that over and over again. Uh, just think about LR, the so-called right, center-right party, right? So. I'm losing count, but I'm trying to remember, um, once upon a time we had the RPF, uh, then it reinvented itself into the UDR, then Chirac took it over in 1976 and called it the RPR, then Sarkozy took it over and called it the UMP, and then it turned into the so-called LR. It's a joke, right? Uh, French political parties are extraordinarily weak and relatively unimportant. Um, uh, politically for, for very simple reasons, right? The institution of the presidential election is a highly personalistic kind of institution. It forces individual candidates to promote themselves. And we've seen over and over again in the history of the Fifth Republic, effectively um, political entrepreneurs who created their own parties based on their own good name and whose parties basically fade away once they leave the scene, right? The socialists basically suffered terribly from that because Mitterrand made his own party, served his terms, went away, and then the party collapsed. Um, and the same can be said with, uh, with the LR, right? So I'm not at all surprised. And then you go to think about the institution that really matters even more for the next elections coming up at the, at the National Assembly, which is local France. France is made up of 36,000 communes, right? This is boutique politics royale. This is basically the kind of situation where all you need to do is to run in your good name and know a bunch of people locally in order to carve out one of many, many, many constituencies, 577 members of the French assembly. It's an astronomical number for a country of 60 million people. Very few democracies have that many members of parliament, the UK and Italy aside, right? And so the basis for election of a local politician in France, the geographical constituency and the social constituency is minute and does not require any form of institutional political party, right? And so what happens then is that parties only have a life to the extent that they can form a so-called group parlementaire, you know, sort of parliamentary caucus uh, of a very low threshold, which has gone down and down and down in part because the left tried to save the communist party from disappearing uh, back in the 80s. So the threshold of 30 was lowered now to I think 20. 
And so it takes a very small cabal of people to have an existence as a political party in parliament, but this is not this is very artificial, right? So I'm not very worried. And then the other problem is, you know, when you look at the candidates today and how we think about voters and how they map to political parties, we have to remember that there were always 20% far left people in France. Communist Party, 1981, 20% of the vote, right? Uh, to which we could add at the time 30% of the, of the central left when the socialists were, were at their peak, right? So Mélenchon in many ways represents that cluster that's always been there, regardless of the label that you can attach to as to whether it's the far left, the whatever left, the Mélenchon, the Insoumis, the communists, you name it, they're there and they haven't moved. What is very important is that the center has shifted. Effectively, Macron has swallowed the Socialist Party and has swallowed the left of the right and recreated this you know, extremely important middle ground, um, which you know, if you read Anthony Downs, the median voter resides in. You know, and Macron's genius, I think, is to have done that, to basically occupy the terrain of the median voter, which has shifted to the right uh, and he will rely on a probably right-wing coalition. I don't think, I don't buy the argument of a cohabitation. I think it will be a coalition with residual members of the, of the LR, uh, which will in line with uh, where most voters tend to be. Uh, and that's why the so-called traditional parties have disappeared, but they're being replaced or, or relabeled, if you like, by uh, the process that is inherent to the election of the presidential election in France. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I, I want to turn to Emily now and, and uh, look at one aspect that we haven't discussed so far. I mean, France, of course, is a, uh, a global power, but uh, there are also uh, French people living outside of France who contributed to the elections, which, which is something that we have researched uh, extensively. So what, what has been the position of the French people overseas? What are and, and then similar to my question to everyone else, what are your expectations of Macron's uh, second, uh, second presidency? Thank you, Stefan. Uh, it's great to be here tonight with you all. Uh, I'm no expert of, um, of the French overseas. I'm just an uh, elected official representing the French overseas in my constituency here of Hong Kong and Macau. So uh, I can uh, speak uh, on behalf of that and uh, share with you some insights. But I understand from the audience that there are some uh, students and I'd like to, uh, before I go into the, um, the topic of your question, to share with you a bit of a background. So basically, uh, we have been uh, talking about uh, France and mostly metropolitan France, but metropolitan France, it is this tiny blue dot on this world map. And France is actually extended in overseas uh, territories. It can be departments and it can be uh, regions with uh, more autonomy. And uh, France has overseas territories, you know, in the Caribbean, in the South Pacific, and also in uh, the uh, Indian Ocean. And all these people are French people on the, uh, the banner, the French flag. Um, they have different types of uh, uh, autonomous uh, government, but they are all uh, French citizens. And as such, they, uh, they also voted. What came indeed as a surprise, and it is uh, uh, shown here, what came as a surprise is basically that the overseas uh, French, they voted mainly, and we can see it on on, uh, on the um, uh, slide I uh, shared with you, except in the uh, South Pacific, the overseas territories of uh, France voted for uh, Marine Le Pen. And that was a real shock indeed, because last time uh, it was um, Jean-Marie Le Pen, all these uh, overseas territories said no to the uh, far right. And we can understand very much why, because those overseas territories have a historical legacy of uh, uh, slavery related uh, history and identity. So uh, those values indeed contradict each other. So we have seen uh, this very year, except in the South Pacific, all the other French people living in overseas territories, they have voted mainly in favor of Marine Le Pen. So the question 
uh, that we are asking is really indeed uh, why. When we say that uh, Le Pen uh, gathered close to 60% of the vote, it is indeed a clear majority. So this vote in favor of the far right is the reflection of a very deep uh, malaise, as we say in uh, French. It is a signal, a strong indicator uh, that the state policy that has been pursued for decades in all those territories, and uh, Pierre Landry also know one of them, he's, uh, he's from La Réunion, has uh, been failing uh, and very much especially so in the uh, last five year period. So we see that uh, these territories, they are situated in uh, very different parts of the world and all of them have voted for the far right for different reasons. For example, in uh, Guadeloupe and Martinique, you had a strong resistance against the uh, COVID-19 vaccine policy. Uh, you also have a, a legacy of the usage of uh, Clodercon, which is a very harmful pesticide that has basically destroyed the land and contaminated 90% of the people of Guadeloupe. Uh, and they are going to live with that in their DNA and pass it on to uh, possibly a next generation. So we have this very much entrenched uh, challenges and uh, discontent with the uh, policies coming from Paris. So what uh, is to be uh, taken as a, as a message here? One might say that uh, indeed in those uh, um, peripheral uh, territories of the French Republic, people are fed up, but they don't say uh, that they uh, don't adhere anymore to the uh, Republican values. Uh, they very much are attached to the uh, support of the state, but it was rather a vote of, uh, um, of saying that they are fed up with uh, being uh, left uh, behind uh, of what has been happening on men in France. So they want to be recognized as uh, um, full French citizens with equal rights as those French citizens uh, from metropolitan uh, France. Now, another uh, uh, way to answer your good question, Stéphane, is to look at also the offices uh, French, but the offices French living abroad. So they are offices because they live abroad. And this is uh, basically what we have here. France is a, a very large diaspora state, such as China, such as Israel, such as Turkey, all these examples of diaspora states who have adopted different types of diaspora governance. And as a democratic country, uh, France has given uh, voting rights to its uh, um, nationals living abroad. And you can see, so uh, we see here the map. Maybe here it's uh, clearer. We can uh, on the left hand side see the map of all the people uh, living abroad. And we have this number, 1 million point six, are all the people who are registered voters. So altogether, there is an estimate of about 3 million people living. Uh, outside of French territories, living overseas, out of uh, whom 1.6 million are registered voters. So you are talking about a uh, significant proportion of voters, uh, very important that that tilt uh, the game, uh, if it comes to that. And the world is divided uh, into uh, 11 uh, constituencies, and this is the map on the right hand side, so you can see that there are 11 constituencies and the constituencies of uh, the 11th one is the largest one, you can see that it goes from uh, Eastern Europe down to Oceania, and this is the constituency of the French uh, living in um, Asia, and uh, I represent the French in this tiny dot territories of Hong Kong and Macau. And when we look at how the French uh, living abroad have uh, voted, well, uh, in the first round, uh, you have seen that Macron has indeed come out far ahead, you know, far ahead already because Macron with all his values, uh, liberal uh, minded, open to Europe, open to the world, indeed talks to uh, very much to the French who have uh, themselves uh, made expatriation a way of living. And in the second round, it was uh, even more clear that the French overseas voted many, many in support of Emmanuel Macron. However, there is another uh, very important figure that is the figure of abstentions. 
And we are talking about a huge rate of abstentions amongst the people uh, living overseas. 64% of the French living overseas or uh, in uh, abroad uh, have decided not to vote. Of course, they are always um, very simple practical reasons to that. The first one being the method of voting for the presidential elections. There was no electronic vote. We had to go in person to the voting uh, stations. And we have seen on the previous map, you know, uh, voting stations in those large areas are not always uh, very easy to reach, especially when we live in China and it's COVID time. So, uh, for example, the French people living in Shanghai, everything was prepared in the voting booth, but they were not, there was a lockdown and they could not go out of their homes to uh, vote. Very simple example. Um, we could vote by proxy, that is to give our voting right to a representative, but uh, this, um, the method was complicated to give a proxy and you have also to go in person uh, to an authority uh, in order to give your proxy documents. So beyond these practical reasons that have uh, prevented uh, thousands of French people to indeed uh, go to vote, we also have a kind of uh, um, understanding that the French people living abroad were not very much interested, not at all impressed by what was uh, going on in the uh, presidential campaign and the fight among these, um, uh, these uh, candidates. And most of those candidates did not even bother to talk to the French living abroad and did not uh, were not concerned with what they were going through abroad, especially in those COVID times, all but one. Uh, Emmanuel Macron was the only candidate who consistently in the last two weeks of the campaign wrote to all of us a letter per day. So that was a huge effort from his uh, campaign team and maybe that was uh, what uh, paid off. Now, uh, looking towards what those uh, uh, next five years are going to uh, bring to, uh, to France, I would say that the coming five years will be very, very hard. And it, we don't need to go into the next five years. I think la rentrée, as we say in uh, French, uh, September will be a very hard time, you know? And I really expect that uh, social movements are going to come back. Um, I have worked a little bit on the yellow vest and the yellow vest have been dormant after 2018, but uh, we can uh, sense that uh, uh, if Mélenchon does not get uh, the, in the legislative assembly, we can expect social movements to be back on the street starting in uh, September. So it will be tough times, tough end of the year for Mr. Macron, that's for sure. Thank you very much. Tough times for Mr. Macron and, and a hot September predicted by Emily. I would like to now take the conversation a bit further uh, beyond uh, France, and, and, and Roland is certainly a perfect candidate to discuss that. So I'm curious to hear your views on uh, the French role in, in Europe. You know, is Macron going to be the undisputed leader of the European Union? And one aspect, and, and I have to say that it surprises me a bit. I mean, I lead the conversation, so I should have, might have, could have uh, brought it up earlier, but no one mentioned Russia uh, yet. Uh, and, and of course, uh, Putin might have been delighted about uh, Marine Le Pen winning the elections, and thankfully that's not uh, what happened. But I'm curious to hear what's your take on this, Roland. Is, is Macron going to be now uh, more resolute in his stance towards Russia? There's been talk about uh, further sanctions that might have the potential to hit also uh, EU economies, domestic economies in Germany or in France. Energy prices might be a further increase. So the French role in, in Europe, and then in turn, uh, uh, what, what Europe's position towards Russia might be in, in the second presidency of President Macron. Thank you, Stefan. Um, I think like the, the election of uh, Emmanuel Macron was received really for, with a big sigh of relief in Brussels, and I think in other European capitals as well. And I think this is something that uh, was really I heard from somebody who works in Brussels that they were, you know, nail biting and then suddenly like they're very relieved and uh, <laughs> they know that it's like now they have five more years of a uh, very stable leadership in Europe. Um, I think it is quite clear 
um, from the optics of the Macron campaign and also from his recent speeches that he will try to reinvent himself as the European statesman now. I mean, he's now in one of the positions where he's been there the longest now after Angela Merkel's departure. So this is definitely something that we might see. But the question is what kind of France and what kind of Europe? Um, we've heard before from the previous panelists the importance of the legislative elections. And this also has a huge impact on France's role in Europe. So if he in June receives a majority in the National Assembly, uh, albeit maybe a weakened one, you know, that, is, that will still allow him to focus, to do a lot on the domestic agenda, bringing up some of the reforms uh, and projects that, uh, that he was not able to complete in the first term. But if he's forced into a cohabitation, um, if the left really does well, and uh, should there be a cohabitation, and it wouldn't be the first time in the, fence, in the Fifth Republic that this happened, then he's really forced into focusing on foreign and security policy, because those are the roles designated by the constitution to the president. And, uh, and that would have very clear implications for Europe in, in general. And I also think like, you know, if we have, depending on the outcome of this legislative elections, you know, we might really see an uptick in protests later in the year, and that will hamstring uh, his um, European ambitions also. Um, now, one thing I think like that many Europeans have been sort of finding curious about is, you know, I think in most European countries, the view of Macron is actually more positive than in France itself. So he's seen, you know, as a decent, you know, amicable, reformist, ambitious politician. And uh, whereas in France, there's a lot of complaints about his arrogant style and being a president of the rich. And, you know, sort of like image problems also that he found difficult to dispel. And I think also many European, like outside of, outside of France, they're a little bit puzzled about, you know, why is, the, what is, why is there so much attraction to the extremes and in particular the extreme right? You know, with uh, Marine Le Pen obviously did very well in this election. I mean, she capitalized over 40% of the vote in a country of the size of France, which is, you know, I mean, it's, it's, very significant if you compare to most of what other European politicians receive in their election. Um, and in addition to this, I mean, she was for the first time overtaken by Eric Zemmour on the right. And it is yet to be seen who will be running for the right in five years time. You know, is it really Marine Le Pen who will carry that torch or will it not be uh, people like Eric Zemmour? And I think this, is, this issue of the right is also closely connected to the question of Europe. And I recently heard a very interesting conversation with an economist who said like many of the problems sort of go back to a key year in, in 1992, because in that year, the European Union um, uh, had signed a treaty, the Treaty of Maastricht. And the Treaty of Maastricht came within a hair's whiskers of being rejected in a, in a referendum in France in 1992. And incidentally, what is also interesting, it is the year where Euro Disney in the east of Paris was opened and it was celebrated as sort of like this new attraction and whatnot where people can go and play. But it is also a point from which the French economy started to morph a little bit from a manufacturing economy into a service oriented economy. And the manufacturing sector in particular has gone downhill ever since. And this has also created a lot of grievances and things like that uh, that haven't really been picked up on. And he, this economist painted out another, another important issue, which is in the early 1990s, there's also the breakthrough of something that we call les grands surfaces, the big supermarkets on the outside of towns. Like in every town, there's an Auchan, there's a Carrefour, there's a Casino or things like that, that, um, uh, that people have to drive to, you know, to do their shopping. So all of these things, have, this kind of structural economic change has come together with also a degree of hesitancy about where Europe is going. Um, and this was again displayed in 2005 when France rejected the European constitutional um, treaty in a referendum. Now, one thing I just, uh, I think is, uh, I noticed while watching the, the different talk shows and, uh, and uh, debates and things like that during the campaign was like, I felt like all the candidates were a little bit disingenuous with voters because um, they, I don't think they were really quite upfront about the role of France in the world and in Europe. It was just sort of assumed that France has a leadership role. It was assumed that France can play an independent role and should actually play it. 
but there was much less focus on, on real issues holding France back in the world. And this is, for instance, like the issue of debt, the very high and very rapid increase of the national debt over the last few years is the loss of the global market share, particularly also in key markets like here in Asia. And it's also France rapidly thinning strategic culture. We've seen a very, um, the, you know, basically France being booted out of the Asia Pacific in this AUKUS deal last year between Australia, United States and the United Kingdom. Um, France is now wrapping up its combat operations in Mali, um, where incidentally Russian troops are now coming in, Russian mercenaries are coming in. And likewise, the same has happened in the Central African Republic. These are all places where France has sort of had a very peculiar, and very strong influence in the past. It remains to be seen what will happen are the relationship between France and India, which is something that is developing. Um, and when we look a little bit closer to Europe, I think like France, in particular Macron needs to be a little bit careful because like he has had, he has identified a very ambitious European agenda but in many other European capitals, it comes across a little bit as being too self-interested on France. And he hasn't maybe not been able to generate the kind of support he needs in other capitals to actually carry this forward. Uh, that is something that I think that, 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 he will need to be, that he will need to watch. And in, we can see first indications, which I think should, be, should alert him to pay more attention to this. And I will just give three examples. The first one is recently, it was the Dutch and the Spanish government coming together to sort out a compromise among European leaders to fix and reform the Stability and Growth Pact. And the Stability and Growth Pact is something that underpins the European single currency, the euro, uh, which is in reform, which is in, in, in need of reform. But um, it was not France who sort of organized this compromise. Uh, it was the Dutch and the Spanish being in the leading scene. Likewise, in another front, Italy recently negotiated new um, gas deliveries with Algeria, which has traditionally, um, uh, you know, sent gas to France, you know, so now basically Italy has sort of bypassed that and has signed new deals uh, with Algeria to wean itself off uh, Russian gas dependency. And we have a new Eastern like, partnership forming in the Eastern Mediterranean that is also interesting, that, 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 that binds together Greece, Cyprus, Israel, and to some extent, also Bulgaria. Um, here, the plan is, 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 comes to do with defense, it comes to do with migration, it comes to do with territorial claims. It, uh, it has to do also with uh, bringing gas from Israeli gold, uh, gas fields into, via Cyprus into Greece and then also um, into that part of Europe, uh, which traditionally France has had an important role and which we saw not that long ago in, in Lebanon. Yeah, and nothing, not, not very much uh, came to this. So the question is like, why have some of these initiatives that Macron has been supportive of, why haven't they really bear, borne fruit? And I think it really comes down to something what uh, I think it was Alistair mentioned it before, it's the economy. France really direly needs to fix its economy. And in particular, it needs to fix uh, issues of productivity and it needs to fix this absolutely massive spending in the public sector. This is really starting to hold back France. And that is something that is like that I felt during the campaign, um, this was not really discussed uh, yeah, openly enough with the, French, with the French population, which I think was a missed opportunity. If these things get tackled throughout a number of reforms, I think you know, France can really, Macron could really um, be very effective as a European leader. However, if not, he will be continuously being held back by domestic problems. So um, I shall leave it here and I look forward to questions. Thank you. And thank you all for keeping your contributions uh, clear and concise so that we have plenty of time left for discussion. I would like to invite uh, our, uh, our uh, listeners, participants uh, to, to, you can raise your, uh, you can raise your hand, I think, yeah, or, or we have, we have, okay, we have a chat box and, and James, uh, so is it possible, James, for you to turn on the camera and, and microphone? I don't know what the setup uh, is that, that we have. Uh, well, if, if not, I, I'll, I'll just read it. So that is uh, coming from James Downs. Uh, so two questions, two questions. Question one, what would be your predictions for the upcoming French legislative elections in June 2020? So a number of speakers uh, 
touched on this. Then Roland just spoke about the possibility of commutation. And James is joining us. Okay. And then the second question is, yeah, so which political party is likely to be the main winner and would Macron's and Marsh retain a majority in the 16th National Assembly? The second question, what now for the, uh, for the Yellow West uh, movement, right? Will they make a return and hinder Macron's second term presidency? Which is again, what, what uh, Roland mentioned. So this uh, need for economic reforms and the strong resistance against them might, might seriously challenge, uh, challenge uh, Macron. So who might want to uh, uh, discuss that? Should we go back to Pierre, for example? Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah I, I have something to, to, to add about the uh, elections. I mean, one very important feature of, and rather unusual one uh, in the French system is it's a two round election. But unlike the French presidency, it's a system in which you only need to get 12.5% of the votes in the first round to remain present at the second round. Um, and that effectively means that if you don't have a uh, mechanism to create coalitions ex ante uh, between well-formed political parties, for example, uh, it's very easy to imagine a large number of districts where you will have three or perhaps even four candidates uh, that will survive the first round and be present against each other for the second round. And then it's a free for all. Basically, it's whoever comes first will win the particular district. And so, um, it makes it very hard to predict which party uh, will uh, dominate. But again, I'd, I'd like to come back to the point I made because that particular system is tailor-made for local personalities who don't have a particularly strong party backing, uh, who have enough of a local presence to survive the first round and make a case in the second round. And I, my prediction will be that it's not going to be a situation where there will be cohabitation. It will be a situation where it might be a very hard to define kind of national assembly where a large number of micro parties or micro personalities will effectively dominate the political system and will have to work something out uh, once they are elected. And that makes the, the building of a majority particularly complicated. But I don't think it's going to be a situation where we will see uh, a clear winner or a clear loser. Uh, the system is too subtle for that. Yeah. Yeah. Can I can I just uh, 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 thanks James for that very interesting question. I'd just like to pick up on the a couple of things uh, that Pierre said. I think in a way, what's interesting is uh, you know the the linkage with with local personalities, and I think I, I agree with you. But I do uh, I do think in a sense that that mechanism has been weakened a little bit by the uh, the limitations on cumul de monda. I mean, I think you could have said in the past that that was a real mechanism that allowed that. Now it's a bit more uh, distant. And I think in a way, when we look at the, uh, you know, the, 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 the parliamentarians that were elected under, for Macron the last time round, uh, what strikes me, and obviously some of them have some local roots, but many of them haven't done, you know. So in a sense, they've been, they're a bit rudderless. They, they haven't managed really to, 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 a lot of them anyway, to, 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 uh, to become uh, notable, to, 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 to use that word. I think the, the other thing, what makes it a bit difficult is, of course, it's, it's actually 12.5% of registered electors to get through to the second round. So that means that the actual tariff, it's about, if you think it's a bit 50% turnout, it's 25%. So that actually makes it even more difficult. Of course, it throws up the possibility of effectively a plurality system. If you've got three candidates with, you know, uh, and a candidate with 30% of the vote can get 100% of the representation, depending on what the others do. Well, my maths is not with me today, but, you know, you get the drift. But I think, um, you know, I think we, so I think it, it, it is a bit unpredictable. I would, I would personally say that I think a, a cohabitation is a bit unlikely, personally. Um, I think there are mechanisms to make it extremely difficult. Um, and I think also the fact that the uh, the left, I mean, that obviously, clearly, the left parties, in a way, are uh, getting their act together, to, 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 to use that phrase. Uh, but, I, but I think it's going to be extremely difficult, you know. I mean, I, I think it's going to be actually quite difficult. If, if La France Insoumise is too hegemonic, then, in a way, uh, you know, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to turn people away, I think, from... Uh, 
from from that that left alternative if it exists. I mean, I'm sure that you know the, the left parties will do as well as they can, but I don't think they're going to be in a position to get a majority. And Marine Le Pen, just to finish on this, I mean, even in previous elections when the Front National was very strong, they've always had this difficulty, except in some places of key geographical concentration in actually breaking through that boundaries. And I, and I think they might get a few more deputies this time, but I think it's going to be unlikely to see a, more than a, you know, a, a, a few uh, a national, a, a national rally deputies. Okay, I, I see one uh, question that came up in, in uh, Q&A, and I, I invite all participants, you can also uh, write in either in the chat function or, or the Q&A function. I see one question that Emily already addressed in Q&A uh, that uh, uh, is again about uh, Russian, the Russian invasion, which we haven't discussed that much. The question is uh, from Catherine Both uh, at uh, Hong Kong Baptist University. Uh, that is uh, whether the Russian invasion in Ukraine influenced uh, the outcome of the election. Did people vote for Macron because of that? And I would expand that question uh, and asking again, uh, where might want to address the, the question, you know, what to expect yeah. of France now in relation to, to Russia and uh, Ukraine? I think um, if, if I may uh, take this, uh, one thing that was rather curious in this uh, fallout from the Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine was that everybody expected Marine Le Pen, this would really hurt Marine Le Pen. And she was very you know, nimble and very able to distance herself quite well from her rather close relationship with Putin um, in a way that, for instance, Eric Zemmour could not do. And he was quite unapologetic about it. And I think that really hurt him in the polls. So when, it, when, when, when uh, the election day came. Now, uh, another phenomenon that I found was interesting is that how quickly basically the discussion turned away from the war in Ukraine and actually turned back to domestic issues and particular very, very pedestrian domestic issues like the purchasing power and inflation and fuel prices and these kinds of things, you know, so things that are very quite at, quite at home at a time when everybody expected a kind of rally around the flag you know, um, happening or something like that in the in, in the wake of the of uh, Russia's um, invasion of Ukraine. So I don't think it really had such a huge deal, except in the sense that it's like it allowed uh, Marine Le Pen to distance herself from Putin and to cast herself in a very different light than she had done before. You know, so very focused on this kind of agenda of caring for the people and, and criticizing the sanctions for putting an undue economic burden on ordinary French who are already struggling to make meat and to make uh, ends meet and things like that. You know, that, I, that discourse actually carried quite well for her. But um, yeah, so I, I don't think it was the war swayed all that many people. That was my impression, at least. Emily, would you also like to, to comment on that? I, I, I saw your response there. Maybe you, you might want to expand on it. Yes, so uh, I, I was uh, responding to uh, Catherine. Catherine, thank you for your question. And also thank you, Jim. So maybe I will take uh, Catherine's first. Uh, we have observed the rally, the flag uh, kind of a sentiment uh, in times of crisis, in times of election, if you have a, a war uh, coming into your election, the uh, natural sentiment of the people is to maintain stability. And one way to, uh, to keep stability is to elect the, uh, the same president. So we have uh, observed that. And uh, then Roland gave uh, also uh, excellent explanation. So I'm not going to, to go further into this. Going back to Jim, your questions. Um, I, I would say that in the upcoming legislative elections, Macron is going to keep um, presidential majority at the National Assembly. Uh, maybe not uh, that uh, uh, comfortable, but I think he will uh, still uh, be uh, ahead. The main reason is that the left has been unable to reach any type of agreement. Uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon is, uh, um, is not giving any uh, terrain, and then they cannot talk to, uh, to the Green Party. And the only left-wing party that has been uh, 
successful in this negotiation is indeed the Socialist Party, but remember their score, it's a very minimal, so it's, uh, we, we don't see a kind of a big left-wing uh, coalition. Um, so that's uh, the first question for uh, James. And the second uh, question, it's about the Gilets Jaunes. You know, Marine Le Pen has been, uh, uh, has started her campaign last fall with purchasing power as the main thought topic, and she has kept this one topic all throughout. Um, people continue, you know, after the election, people continue to struggle with 900 euros, 600 euros per month in a couple. Some couples only earn 1,600 euros per couple. And when we have to pay a rent of 700 euros, what do you have left to pay all the other utility bills and to buy, uh, to buy food? So, and this is a common situation. You know, and from the young people who are underemployed to the elderly people who get a very uh, small pension. So we can see social protests, social movements coming back. Uh, they will call themselves Gilets Jaunes or Les Insoumis or whatever, but these people, they are just fed up of not having food or proper decent living. So we can expect a uh, rentrée sociale that is uh, going to be very hot. Thank you, thank you. So I'm keen to collect a couple more questions from the audience. Uh, so please uh, type it into the chat function or uh, Q and A. Uh, we don't have any any. I, th th there is one question that interests me that I, I I think might be worth discussing further, and 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 that is something that that Roland uh, discussed that the French electorate over the last couple of decades has been uh, fairly divided on, on Europe, that the Treaty of Maastricht was only passed with the narrowest of margin. Uh, the Constitutional Treaty was defeated in 2005, and now these cost of living issues. I, I'm curious whether that also impact of the, on the French perception of, of the EU. Like I understand that President Macron is, is very proud to his commitment to Europe, both uh, uh, at the outcome of the last presidential elections and now again, this time, uh, uh, the, the rally that celebrated his re-election was underpinned by, uh, you know, Beethoven's number nine, the uh, EU anthem. Is there a bit of a disconnect between the government commitment uh, to the EU and the people who, who might not be all that enthusiastic because of the perception that, that the EU, rather than protecting them from uh, globalization, is the vehicle of, of uh, globalization. So maybe I can go first. Yes, please, please. Uh, very good question, Stefan. But when you say the people, we'd like to come back to uh, a concept that uh, some of us have uh, mentioned before, that is the deep divide. And you uh, even used that one in uh, one of your early questions. And we are talking about two types of France. You have one that is uh, globalized, that is outward looking, that is liberal minded, the one who are educated and who live in uh, urban centers. And so those ones, they are very much pro Europe and pro-EU, um, and they would follow Macron to have a stronger EU stance. And then you have all the others and the one who have voted for Marine Le Pen, basically, uh, or who have abstained. Uh, let us not forget that abstention was really high. So we are just talking about Macron versus Le Pen, but I would say that they were a third person uh, who gained also in this election, and that is the abstention vote. And these people, so if we uh, add together the one who voted for Le Pen and the one who abstained, they, uh, I won't use the word Eurosceptic, but uh, indeed they are not as open-minded towards the Europe than uh, Macron himself. Thank you, Natalie. Alistair, yeah. Can I just say there's great, these are great questions and they're, and, they're, and they're really they're really very, very rich. I'd like to come back to actually uh, just very briefly something that Roland said that I thought was very interesting in your in your in your presentation. That it's, it's linked to all of this. But it's the idea really of, you know, I mean, it's it, the type of Europeanization that is acceptable in, I suppose, in French political discourse, both amongst leaders and electors. We might say that obviously we we can't always expect France to win in a way uh, at the European level because the sort of a Europeanization project it carries is not consistent with many preferences in other European countries. I could go into that in a bit more detail, but and I think it sort of underpins what you were saying, and it is also linked into um, 
you know, one of the things about Europeanization, of course, is how how can you export your your difficulties? Basically, can you export your your problems to a European level? And I think some of the skepticism about Macron's um, uh, uh, willingness to get the European Union to spend money now, of course, is that. But well, of course, it's it's actually exporting uh, problems that are not uniquely French. Of course not. But in a way, breaking some some you know some some sacred cow budgetary cows is is clearly something that Macron is is, is looking to do, and we saw this with the uh, you know with the COVID fund. I think we're seeing it with the idea you know the idea that the resilience fund that you know Macron internally has you know said we'll have a resilience fund, but the extent to which that can be Europeanized in a way, this can explain some of the. Uh, the difficulties, I think, with, with the Dutch, you mentioned the Dutch, you know, I mean, clearly there's a, there's a long going, you know, a tension between France on the one hand, the frugal four on the others. And I think in a way we have, uh, this feeds back also into the, the domestic level, because clearly to some extent, I think that the French electors don't see things that way. Well, some do, obviously, some, I mean, I totally buy in, I totally agree with, with Emily's comment about uh, social, fra territorial fracture and so on. But I think the way that the European issue needs to be framed uh, at the European level and, and at the, the French level can itself create some tensions. And I think in a way, <clears throat> there's probably no, no better example of this than the single currency. We won't talk about it in, in detail. But I think in a sense, it's clear that, you know, does is Europeanization there to to favor, in a sense, uh, standard of living, cost of living, uh, the, the welfare of the people, create a social Europe and so on, which are those good things uh, that in a way French electors would support, or is it there to exercise fiscal financial discipline to, to, to bring, you know, to get to the root of that economic problem, to share those burdens of sharing a currency? Because of course, that's something that's not very explicitly said in public debate, but of course, sharing a currency or, no, not even yet. Well, sharing a currency creates tremendous uh, pressures for convergence. And if those pressures convergence are not respected, then, you know, uh, the jury is still out about the very long term sustainability of, uh, of the euro. So I think this is great. These are great, uh, really interesting questions. And, uh, and I, but, but I do think, um, you know, there, there's so much more we could talk about. We'll have to have a special session just on that. Another yes. HKU, HKBU seminar series. <laughs> Thank you, Alistair. More questions from the audience? Don't be shy. I, I, I can see that the, a few of our students One. Are, are here, colleagues. Uh, so don't, don't be shy. Please, please. Uh, if I may, Stefan, Kathleen yes. asked about, uh, do we have more details about how people voted according to age and gender? Hmm. And I put in the chat room the link to the excellent uh, um, surveys made by uh, Sciences Po Paris and CVPOF. So if you click on the link, you know this is a, a, a excellent uh, presentation. And allow me just um, to share this, if I may. Yes, of course. Yes, yeah, so uh, I, you should be uh, seeing this step one. And uh, if you can you see my screen? I'm not sure I am. We can see it. Yeah, we got it. Okay. So that's one. And it's uh, quite simple. And you can see, of course, it is in French. Um, but it is indeed. So you can see purchasing power as number one. And you can have how uh, they voted according to the topics. The question, Stefan, that you kept asking. And uh, yes, very few war. of us. <laughs> yes, it's the war in Ukraine. Uh, and it came indeed in a third in, uh, in uh, the people's uh, um, priorities. And then we have uh, uh, more on their age uh, and study groups. So you can, it's a long study and I encourage our audience, especially the students to, uh, to uh, use this link and to use the uh, free resources of the CVPOF, excellent literature. Thank you, thank you, Emily. And I'm glad you, you mentioned the war again because not many people did. And so if, it's, if it was number three on, on uh, the uh, people's mind, then it was not completely relevant. And, and related to that, I, I would like to pick up on what Alistair just discussed, that is the, the Euro, right? And, and I mean, it, to me, the big question there is Franco-German relationship, yeah? And, and whether the Franco-German engine can now be restarted and of course, following the debates in Germany, the anxiety is always that 
uh, French just want Germans to pay for whatever uh, they they want to do, right? That the, the entire eurozone is just a vehicle to cover, uh, you know, the extensive welfare state that the French uh, constructed, or 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 the fiscal irresponsibility of Italy and 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 the rest of Europe. Uh, but there too, there is the added dim dimension, I, I think, uh, that is the security dimension, which is something that is close to uh, Macron's heart. We we hear him talking about a sovereign. Uh, Euro, European sovereignty, uh, 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 etc. So, uh, can Franco German engine be restarted? Then the security dimension is not irrelevant because my sense is that in, in, in the countries of Central Europe, when you look at the debates in Poland, the Baltic states, the Czech Republic, uh, there is a growing suspicion of, of Germany and France, in fact, when it comes to safeguarding uh, European security, and, and they are looking more increasingly towards NATO, and they're not interested in EU developing an alternative to NATO because they feel uh, let down, frankly, particularly by the German reluctance towards Ukraine. And even President Macron's attempts to mediate with Putin, it, it, it's a mixed kind of picture when you see it uh, kind of perceived in, in countries like the Baltic States and Poland. So I'm curious whether any, any one of our panelists have views on that. Don't forget the war. Uh, it's probably more salient in Germany uh, than in France, but still. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, Pierre, Pierre, I, raise your hand, and, and then Roland. Yeah, right? uh, Pierre, I, I, and, I th and thank you. I think it's very interesting. I mean, one of the uh, shifts I think that's going to probably drive whether or not the Franco-German engine works or doesn't work uh, is the potential crisis uh, for gas supplies into Germany. I mean. Macron has insisted recently on the importance of nuclear power, of restarting nuclear power in France and asserting uh, energy independence uh, through these very old French traditional means, right? They go back to the 1960s and 70s, uh, which Germany had walked away from uh, much, I think, to its regret these days. Um, and so I think how Germany navigates its economic uh, crisis caused by uh, the even perhaps the blockade of gas deliveries for, by Russia um, is going to be really critical to that kind of you know, debate as to what sort of economic policy, energy policy, uh, and even federalization perhaps of even European energy production uh, looks like uh, going, going, going down. Uh, so that's, that's one, one really key, key issue. The second one, as you said, is the, the sort of military relationship, uh, which has always been relatively strong, but relatively bilateral. And neither country has been very eager or able to, uh, to reach out, I think, to other parties in Europe outside of the NATO framework. Um, and France was, of course, outside of the uh, single command uh, for a long time, came back to it under President Sarkozy. Uh, but it's still a relatively complicated relationship. And that, I think, is a real impediment uh, to how the EU and NATO kind of interface in a sort of a smoother way uh, than they have in the past. One good thing, however, is that besides France and Germany, is that because Sweden and Finland, uh, both EU members are potentially going to become NATO members uh, very soon, apparently, that might perhaps ease that process, right? And it could be that there will be greater convergence between discussions about defense policies on an EU basis uh, and how that particular platform uh, works within the broader NATO uh, alliance. Thank you, thank you. Now, now over to, to Roland and maybe one more aspect of that EU-Ukraine relationship that uh, again, when you uh, look at the debates in, in Poland, there is a strong, uh, Kind of sentiment that the government represents that the EU should accelerate uh, Ukraine's uh, application for, for full membership of the EU. But when you look at the debates in, in Western Europe, uh, uh, there is not that much enthusiasm. So th there are three aspects, I suppose. So, first, the Franco German engine in relation to the Eurozone, then uh, the EU as a security actor. And the third one, uh, the prospects of EU enlargement, embracing Ukraine's ambition even more decisively. Uh, Roland? Yeah, I think like one of the, uh, it is, I think undoubtedly true if we talk about uh, France and Europe 
that it is really, we're talking about the only country, the only member state of the European Union that really has a developed strategic culture. And um, that I think this is really something that we notice that countries like Spain and Italy and Germany and Poland is something they don't really have this. And even Germany finds it very difficult to articulate a strategic culture. I mean, we, this is so blatantly obvious at the moment. So I think France has a lot of good impetus. It has a lot of good of ideas. It has, it has been right on many things. It has been proven right on many things, even in contrast to Germany or in, on, on, in comparison, I must say, to, to Germany on issues like energy, on issues like terrorism on issues like security, on issues like China and the Indo-Pacific, on technology, on many of these things, the French instinct has been much closer, not only to what ultimately comes up in Brussels, but also has been sort of proven right by reality. Where it's like, you know, German, I think Germany's instinct has been a little bit, I don't know, like clouded by, <laughs> by other <laughs> political, or ideological or historical considerations or something. Now, I think like the problem really is one about like how to turn these kind of ultimately fairly solid and good ideas on the EU into, into practice. Now there, I think, you know, there is a problem in the Franco-German engine and that is something that is quite clear at the moment also that there is a sentiment that like, you know, France has lots of good of ideas of Europe, uh, but he, they basically, the French want the Germans to pay for it. That sentiment is widespread and that's not a positive development. You know, so it's like that I think it, from both sides, it needs to be reiterated that the EU is not an accounting exercise about who puts in how much money or something like that. But it also needs to be that it's like, you know, there's only so much the net contributors to the EU can, can shoulder. You know? I actually think one of the biggest problems, this is something we may, might not have addressed enough, is actually, I actually find it quite scary to see how acceptable anti-EU and anti-NATO rhetoric has become in this election. And this is part of Le Pen's, you know, um, effort to basically to do something that she call, that we would call like the de-diabolisation, you know, like the de-devilment of the extreme right. She has reinvented herself quite successfully as a much more amicable person and not as this angry woman. And, um, and, and so she has done this quite successfully with her person but she's not done this so successfully with her project. So people say is like that, you know, she basically reinvented herself as a candidate who can govern, but she had a program for opposition. So imagine what could have happened had she had a program to actually govern. You know, in five years time, that might be different. And, it's, and, it's, and it is, I think it will be very difficult for the EU to go forward if the pillar of the whole European project, France, is not behind it. You know, I mean, that we would end up with a very different kind of Europe. You know? Even, I mean, maybe it's only a five-year hiatus if some president gets elected who does not support European integration as it has been customary since up to now. But uh, nonetheless, I think like, you know, there, people should pay close attention to this. You know, this is 40% voting for this is not uh, a sign of... A, a positive development, let me put it this way. Yeah. I cannot hear you, sorry. Thanks, Roland. Sylvain, would you also like to, uh, to comment on, on that aspect, uh, Franco-German relationship and, and the leadership of, of Europe and, and once again, you know, what it might mean uh, to the, the relationship between the EU and, and Russia, will there be more support of, of Ukraine forthcoming? Well, I'm really no specialist, but uh, to me, from my own standpoint, I think the, the uh, war in Ukraine has sort of uh, realigned the uh, uh, European, pro-European sentiment in Europe. and. Uh, I guess Macron has uh, benefited a lot from uh, from this in this uh, re-election uh, as well as uh, Emily was pointing out is uh, French people wanted to elect someone who's seen as stable as a stable option uh, not only at the national level but also at the European level I guess uh, that's all I can say about this. Europe is always a very complex issue, you know. It's a uh, because there are so many things that 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 comes in into play. But uh, 
let, let, let's see how it works over the, the next five years. And that, that also, of course, depends on uh, the, the position of other EU members. And, and also the, um, what we should mention is whether uh, the, the sentiment, we, we have this pro NATO sentiment also gaining uh, ground in uh, many countries that are bothering Russia these days. How about the pro European sentiment that may gain ground in uh, uh, Baltic states and, and so on? So, so, this is something that remains to be seen as well. Thanks. I, I am now uh, anxious about the time, and, and we should be uh, kind of wrapping up and I don't intend to summarize all the key points that have been raised. I'm thinking that uh, maybe what we could do is uh, another short round where everyone will take uh, a minute or, or, or so to tell us what to you was the most important aspect of, of these elections. What are we to look at, you know, uh, for the second round of Macron's uh, presidency? What might have been uh, the biggest surprise uh, for you in, in, in this result and, and, and maybe even something that we haven't discussed yet and, and uh, the audience might be interested in, in looking at. And we could just follow again the, the order of, of speakers. So starting with, with Alistair, right? Just one or two minutes kind of final reflections. Thanks, Chair. That's, uh, that, thanks, Stefan. Uh, they're the, the, the great questions. I think um, what three, three, three quick points. One is, I think actually that there's a clear distinction between first round and second round, not least in the nature of the campaign and the seriousness with which the campaign was was dealt was, was treated by the incumbent president Macron. I think it's fair to say that you know the the, the the argument that there had been no campaign actually until almost the first round was a very powerful argument, and it was not one that was really in favour of, of Macron. And I think the, the idea that, in a sense, you know, Macron's campaign to start with was, to my mind, uh, not particularly successful. It was too lightweight. Uh, he was too busy doing other things like the war in Ukraine. I mean, I've been in of just, but, but, it, but, in, but in, it, which, of course, also had benefits. And there's no doubt about that. But I think, in actual fact, what Macron really woke up and he really showed himself to be a pretty effective political campaigner during in between the two rounds. And so the second lesson I would... Uh, Second lesson I draw is that the, the Republican, if you like, Republican front did not function as a classic Republican front as it might have done back in 2002. But there's nonetheless a Republican front instinct that came out quite strongly amongst electors. There was a determination, actually, that Marine Le Pen would not be elected. And so I think, in a sense, and that obviously benefited Macron. 42% declared they didn't, clearly they, they voted for Macron, I think in the seventy five but they didn't vote for Macron on the basis of his programme, they voted in order to prevent uh, Marine Le Pen getting elected. But that, 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 that actually does create a challenge for Macron. It creates a responsibility for him to take seriously, and this is the third point, um, and my final point, you know, to, 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 to try and think about how these big challenges of democratic articulation uh, and representation and trust you know, these big words, but in a sense, how can these be addressed in the next five years? That's going to be a massively important uh, issue for France and also for more, more generally for Europe. Thank you, Alistair. Sylvain, do you want to add a, a point or two on kind of final reflections? Yeah, so I, I, I guess, uh, as we said before, it's going to be a very difficult uh, five years for Macron, especially at the, the, the beginning, all depends on uh, how much he's able to, to rally uh, people to, who are not, uh, uh, who didn't vote for him or abstentionist uh, at this point. And, uh, but Macron is smart. I, I guess he, he, he is able to reinvent himself also and to, uh, as he said before, he doesn't want to do another five years just like he did uh, in, in the past five years, but he want to, to propose something new. So if he's able to deliver on that, then, then may, things may change. Nonetheless, uh, as Emily said, uh, starting from September, there are going to be a lot of people on the street, probably that that's something that we can expect. Yeah. Cautious optimism there. So yes, definitely. people on the street in September, but the possibility <laughs> for Macron to reinvent himself. Pierre? Yes. What is your take or a final kind of comment? I surprise uh, 
was people's other people's surprises. I was surprised that people did not really believe the polls, did not believe uh, the, what we have been shown for years, and if not, you know, that Macron was going to basically place where he placed. Uh, this is an entirely predictable result, and even the score that Marine Le Pen got was well forecasted by the uh, at least the good public opinion research institutes. You know, going back a long time, you know, in the, not just the last few weeks of the of the campaign. Um, now, uh, to, so to me, that's much more a sign of stability than change. Uh, what I think will be, yes, very difficult is how to govern. Uh, with a weakened majority and, and what will basically happen to this for institutions of the Fifth Republic. You know, as Alistair said, there are mechanisms to ensure that you can get by you know, for five years. We saw that between 1988 and 1993 during the first five years of Mitterrand's second uh, round, which looks a whole lot like Macron. You know, he won handsomely in 1988, not as well as Macron just did. Macron had the, first, the third best score in history uh, behind himself last time and, and Chirac in 2002. Uh, but, you know, Mitterrand was forced to govern with a very weak majority for five years, and that ended with a cohabitation for the remaining two years of his term. Uh, because it's a short five-year term now, you know, it's quite possible that we will limp along for five years with this kind of arrangement, with a minority government uh, just able to survive using Article 49-3 to, to force outcomes once in a while. Thanks, Pierre. So the most surprising aspect, in a way, was that it wasn't all that uh, surprising. that The predictions <laughs> were uh, correct. Emily, just, just one minute. Yes, thank you, Stefan. Thank you so much. Uh, just uh, to relate to uh, the conversation, the parallel conversation on the chat and uh, the age group who voted for whom, and I was responding to uh, Catherine saying that the youngest uh, age group voted for the uh, most senior candidate, who is Mélenchon, and indeed the uh, senior citizen voted mainly for the youngest candidate who is uh, indeed Macron. And uh, we have talked a lot about abstention and I want to uh, give to our audience a takeaway message is that uh, the abstention should not mean that French people are no longer interested in politics. We have said and repeated in this uh, roundtable that the French were not interested in this particular presidential campaign and Alistair even argued that there was no campaign, uh, so to speak. Uh, but the French political life is still very uh, lively. Uh, people continue to uh, talk and argue about politics in the uh, coffee, restaurants and bars and inside the families and the French young people, and that's uh, uh, indeed um, uh, Sylvain's comment, that uh, the young people were also the uh, uh, age group that uh, um, abstained the most. But at the same time, surveys show that the youth of France are also the most engaged in associations. So uh, in civil associations for environment, for human rights, for all, cause, uh, all sorts of causes. So they may abstain from politics as we see it in traditional ways, going to vote to the polling station, to the voting station, but they uh, take into a kind of a duty to actually have an engagement, an active engagement in all sorts of associations. So political life is being redefined and this is part of the restructuring uh, of the French society today. Thank you, Emily. That is also a kind of optimistic note to uh, to end on that, there is a lively, lively kind of political life that the, uh, uh, yeah, the abstention uh, vote shouldn't be uh, overestimated. Roland, a, a sentence or two? Mine is slightly not so optimistic. <laughs> so maybe I'm the wrong person to end this, but like, I just, I just felt a bit astonished that if we, if we count together the votes for Mélenchon, for Le Pen, Zemmour, we get almost 50% or a little bit over 50% of the electorate. So this 50% of the electorate are in some way unhappy with the Fifth Republic. And I think, I find that surprising because the Fifth Republic has been in historical, from a historical point of view, extremely successful. It has given France stability, unheard of stability. It has enabled it, you know, vast economic transform, modernization and transformation and even social transformation. You know, over the time of the Fifth Republic, France has become, has turned away from a very conservative country to one that is very progressive and socially liberal. So the question for me is really like, why don't people see this? And how can we turn around this sentiment that people are unhappy about it? 
you know so i think this is something that uh, that that yeah that i'm thinking about thank you roland and and i think it's good that we end on on uh, yet another question because it is in the nature of any democratic enterprise that it's an open ended project and then it's in the nature of a good discussion about <laughs> a democratic uh, project that it remains open ended and there are many more questions uh, that we could continue discussing, continue raising. But I, I learned a great deal from this conversation. So I would like to thank you all. I thank uh, uh, the audience joining us. Uh, and uh, yeah, <laughs> till next time, we will have another, uh, another conversation, right? So thank you. Thank you. For yeah. Thank you. Au revoir. Merci. Thank you. Bye. Merci. Bye. Bye. Bye.